Hi, and welcome to Harvest Bible Chapel, Kuala Lumpur Online. We hope that the following message will be a blessing to you as you seek to walk with the Lord in spirit and in truth. For more information about our church, please visit www.harvestkl.org or click the link in the description below. Well, good morning and welcome to Harvest. So glad that you could be here with us this morning. It was such a joy to celebrate Easter with many of you last week. Easter is a, a reminder that as Christians, we all live, we live all of life under the radiance and warmth of Christ's resurrection. Jesus is alive, and through his resurrection power, God has made us alive with him. Uh, and we'll come back to that in a moment. We'll come back to that. So if, if you have a Bible this morning, I want to invite you to open to the book of Joshua. This year as a church, we have been walking through a series called The Whole Story. And through our Bible reading, in our small groups, and through our sermon series, we are walking through the whole Bible, trying to show how all of the Bible is telling one story that leads to Jesus. Just by a show of hands, Who's been able to participate in the Bible reading plan, even if it's just for one day this year? Just one day, okay. It's great. That's awesome. And if you're new, we'd love for you to, to join in on this journey with us. You can just pick up right where we are. Uh, if you haven't had a chance yet, uh, or if you lost your Bible reading plan, that's okay. Uh, you can visit our Connect table right in the back. You can pick up one of these. We have plenty more. Uh, and if you did lose, lose yours, there's no shame in that. I lost my first one, and I had no problem going right back and grabbing another one. I have two now. Uh, I, I might get another one at some point because, you know, you just never know. You know. I mean, if you're in multiple Bibles, different things, you just it's nice to have extra. So feel free to, to grab some, give some out to your friends, you know. Uh, now, if you remember from a few weeks ago, we said that God had rescued Israel from their slavery in Egypt. He made a covenant with them at Mount Sinai and was leading them into a land of rest. All of this was part of God's plan to establish Israel as a kingdom of priests. But then things take a turn for the worse. Moses sends spies in the land who come back reporting that it's too dangerous. The people become afraid, and fear can lead you to act in some pretty irrational ways. Israel's fear led to an uprising. They revolted. People are going around the camp passing out tracts saying, don't trust misguided Moses. See, they'd rather go to battle against Moses than against the Canaanites. That seems much safer to them, except that their rejection of Moses is really a rejection of God. So God judges the people. Forty years, he will wait for this unbelieving generation to die out. And on top of that, eventually, even mighty Moses stumbles and falls. He lashes out in anger at the people, showing his own distrust of God. If you ever read a play by William Shakespeare, they say the best way to tell if it's a comedy or a tragedy is that at the end of a tragedy, everyone dies. Well, by the time we get to the end of the Torah, everyone dies. I mean, it sounds like a tragedy. In fact, the conclusion of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses is like, you people can go up to the land that God has given you, but as for me and my house, we're going to go up this mountain and die. That's what he does. But then as we get into the book of Joshua, it opens, it doesn't skip a beat. The opening lines of Joshua are all about the transfer of power from Moses to Joshua and the promise that what God did through Moses, he will now do through Joshua. So starting in verse 2 of chapter 1, the Lord says to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them. To the people of Israel, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness, 
and this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Now Joshua was not a new face for the people. He was a known military leader. He was one of the faithful men that Moses sent among the twelve to spy out the land. Joshua was like Moses' right-hand man. He was like his aide. And in some more immediate way here, Joshua was to be like a new Moses. Let me just go over some of Moses' career highlights with you. Moses encountered the holiness of God at the burning bush, and God gave him a specific call to leave Israel. Moses led the people out of Egypt and was used by God to cross the Red Sea on dry ground. Moses would administer the law and establish Israel as God's covenant people. He would teach them how to celebrate the Passover. Moses would later send out spies to investigate the land God was giving them. Moses would charge Israel to take heart, to enter the land, and to obey all that the Lord commanded. Now consider the opening chapters of Joshua. In chapter 1, Joshua is established as God's leader and assumes command over Israel. In chapter 2, Joshua sends spies into Jericho as they prepare to receive the land God promised. But this time, instead of sending 12 spies, he only sends two. It kind of makes you wonder, do you think Moses ever said to Joshua, if only I had just sent you and Caleb, how different things might have been. I wonder if Joshua learned from Moses. I don't know. In chapters 3 and 4, Joshua leads the people to cross the Jordan River on dry land. Come on now. It's a little bit specific. You've seen this story before. By the way, here's an interesting little detail about the Jordan River crossing. As they set out to cross the Jordan, the text says in chapter 3 that the priests went in with the Ark of the Covenant first to indicate that God is the one who leads them. And as soon as they began to step into the Jordan, the waters rose up in a heap very far away. Now that would be really, really interesting to see. And then in verse 15, there's this little parenthesis. Now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. If you've ever walked along a riverbank with the intention of crossing it, you know that you're looking for a place where the water is shallow or has little movement because the more movement there is, the more dangerous it is. But the time of Israel's crossing, I'm talking about the nation of Israel, Joshua wants you to know that it was flood season. The water levels would have been at their deepest, at their, their most dangerous point. So, so when Israel came to the Jordan, I mean, this is not a small river. I don't want to put words in their mouth, but, but they may have been thinking, you can't be serious. Like, how are we supposed to cross that? The parents are like, like we're done. Like, how are we getting our kids across this thing? I mean, who among us has ever faced difficult circumstances and asked God, why does it have to be like this? Why does it have to happen this way? And I don't say this definitively, but it may just be that God has ordained a difficult path for you, not because he wants you to struggle, but because taking the difficult path will lead you to stop trusting in yourself and start trusting in him. Maybe he wants to use that moment as a milestone for you to remember later on, to strengthen your faith. In chapter 5, after crossing the Jordan, Joshua has the men circumcised to reestablish their commitment to the covenant. And then after that, they celebrate the Passover. And, and this is surprising for at least two reasons. First, the, the people are they're about to go into battle, right? They're about to go into battle. Physically speaking, 
circumcision doesn't sound like a great war strategy. I mean, right before they enter battle, let's weaken the infantry. It doesn't, it just doesn't work. And the second thing is that the Passover is supposed to be like a victory meal. It's a victory meal. The first Passover was meant to celebrate God's deliverance from Egypt. Now they're enjoying the Passover as a celebration, not only of what God has done, but as a promise of what he will do. What he will do. Now I want us to look at three truths being teased out in these opening chapters of of Joshua. And the first truth is this. God desires all his people to participate in serving his cause. God desires all the people to participate in serving his cause. We, we all have a role to play. I mean, for you, do you ever consider what God is doing in the world today and how he's uniquely gifted you for his purposes? What's God calling you to do to leverage your life for his cause? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean God wants you to step into full-time ministry. It could. But if you are a follower of Jesus, then you have become a servant of God, which means he has a claim on your life. God calls all of us to take up the cause of Christ. And so are you living that way? Are you seeking those things? See, most of us flip this. Most of us think, what do I want to see happen in my life? And how can God serve me toward those ends? But Joshua didn't think like that. The people of Israel weren't supposed to think like that. In fact, in the first nine verses of Joshua, God lays all this out for them. He gives them the promise of his presence. He gives them clarity about his cause, and he wants them to have confidence in his command. And how do the people respond? It says in verse 16, They say, all that you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Listen, it's common to fear the call of God in your life. And maybe that comes because we're not sure we're ready to do what he has set before us. Maybe what he's calling you to do is to leverage your job for kingdom purposes. Maybe it's learning how to teach the Bible to non-Christians. Maybe it's mentoring women who are new in the faith. Maybe it's advocating for refugees and serving at a refugee school once a month in the city. Or maybe it's committing to follow Jesus altogether. You've been weighing the cost for some time, but you know it's going to divide your family. You know it's going to cost you friendships, maybe even career opportunities. Listen, this isn't some friend asking you to make a sacrifice here. This is the Lord of Lords calling you to align with Him. The cause of Christ is something we all should seriously consider. We all will die for something. But the question is, what will we learn to truly live for? Second truth, the courage to surrender is built on the foundation of God's presence and promise. The courage to surrender to the command of Christ is is built on the foundation of God's presence and promise to us. We we should be willing to take risks to advance God's cause because we trust that it's what He's doing anyway. The gospel is salvation for sinners. He's working this out among us. We're just stepping into the streams of His divine movement. He's doing it. We're just joining in. And for Joshua, God was calling him to lead the people in receiving the land. And even though the previous generation distrusted God, their fear didn't come out of nowhere. The wickedness of Canaan was still before them. The task at hand warranted struggle. But see, Joshua could not deny the promise and presence of God in his life. That's where his courage came from. You know, the late Tim Keller started Redeemer Presbyterian Church in 1989 in the heart of Manhattan. Before that, New York was a high-crime 
religiously disinterested city. I mean, you could still argue that it's a high crime, religiously disinterested city. New York needed a gospel movement. Personally, Keller didn't want to move to New York. His family definitely didn't want to move to New York. That's usually all you need to know, right? Like that's, that's the, the nicks of the, the even thought of it. But Keller thought someone should, which is why he and others in his denomination tried to recruit someone. They tried to send someone to go. The only problem was that no one else was in a position to do it. So Keller started making a three-hour drive twice a month to essentially spy out the land to assess the spiritual climate of the city. And even though New York City was becoming increasingly diverse, even though it was high in crime, even though it was spiritually barren, those factors didn't deter him. Those circumstances actually convinced Keller that the city was set up for revival. He thought the presence of God was obvious. Every time God calls someone to step out in faith, the assurance He gives them is His presence with them. Go and see. Search for the Lord. But Keller reacted just like any of us would. What made him hesitant to go was his fear that he didn't have the spiritual maturity to do it. He didn't think he could do it. Some of you I know have felt that way about what God is doing through this church. Not that long ago, this church was in what felt like an impossible scenario. You said, I'm I'm not sure we can keep this thing going. It seems evident that God is at work here. but I just don't see how we can keep the doors open. Maybe you felt like you were walking on unstable ground. Maybe you thought either we're going to Fall on our faces, or God's going to hold us. And currently, the only explanation we have for what's happening here is God is holding us. But listen, God doesn't want to just keep the doors open to this church. That's not His goal. He wants the nations to come in to experience the power of the gospel and to be discipled in the ways of Christ. And that's not a one person, two person, three person job. I mean, you probably need a small army to do something like that. And so are you ready to swim in those waters? Are you ready to fight in those battles? You know, eventually Keller became convinced while reading a book called The Christian in Complete Armor by this Puritan named William Gurnall. And in the book, Gurnall writes, it requires more bravery and greatness of spirit to obey God faithfully than to command an army of men. Listen, to be a Christian and to be a captain Keller took that to mean he needed to live more bravely. He started saying, might as well go to New York. I was reading that story early last year. I love that. I thought, might as well go to Kuala Lumpur. People like to ask me what I think about KL. My honest answer is, I like KL a lot. But it was really never about the place. It was really about the one giving the orders. And along the way, I realized I cannot deny the assignment of God on my life. See, to take risks for the kingdom of God, I want to give my life to that. And if you really want to start swimming in those streams, then it causes you to ask, what is the cause of Christ? And how is God uniquely positioning me to serve Him in it. Surrender will require sacrifice. But serving God's cause is never without reward. 
And when you walk down that path, it's the presence of God and the promises of God that become the Christian's greatest possessions. You start to see them as solid joys that give you the courage to go where only God can lead you. Sometimes He calls us into the rough waters. Sometimes He leads us into the battles. We could never win ourselves, asking us to trust that He's with us, that He's fighting for us, and that He will do good through us. In Joshua 1.5, the Lord tells Joshua, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Do you remember the final words that Jesus says in Matthew's Gospel? The words that He says to His disciples? The final words, He says, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's the same promise. He's giving us the same promise. The presence and promises of God are what sustain us as we learn a life of surrender. And ultimately, the reason why we surrender, the reason why any Christian surrenders to the cause of Christ is because we've encountered the Lord ourselves. And Christ changes everything for us, which brings us to our third truth here. Those who encounter Christ the Lord obey the commands of God. Now I want to come back to the, the end of chapter 5. If you're still with me, just flip over a few pages to the end of chapter 5 of Joshua. Remember, the people are about to embark on their quest to take the land. You've probably heard about the fall of Jericho. But this little encounter right before it will reframe how we understand everything else. Jericho was a large city with a massive wall around its borders. I mean, humanly speaking, it would have appeared impossible to break through. And one night before the Israelites are about to take Jericho, Joshua goes out to take a look at it. Maybe he wants to take a moment to remember how far they've come to vow to himself and the Lord that this time things will be different. In verse 13, he says, When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped him and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now the first thing we should notice here is that this is Joshua's burning bush moment. See, Joshua is the commander of Israel's army, but he has just encountered someone greater than he. Some think that Joshua is seeing an angel, but in Revelation 22, after John, the apostle, encounters an angel, he falls down to worship, and the angel immediately says, don't do that. I'm a servant just like you. But Joshua's response here is an act of worship, and the commander doesn't stop him. He goes one step further. He tells him, take off your sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy. This is no angel. This is the Lord in the appearance of a man. A second thing we should notice is who's really in charge. Joshua comes to the commander asking, are you friend or foe? But the commander says, no, but I'm here now. In other words, he hasn't come to serve Joshua. 
And Joshua rightly discerns that he owes this man his allegiance. What does he do? He says, rule me. Command me. Do any of you ever say that to Christ? Rule me. I'm yours. See, this battle isn't what Joshua thought it was. It wasn't Israel's to fight, but God's. Because this battle is really about judgment against sin. Canaan practiced all sorts of wickedness. Idolatry, sexual perversion, child sacrifice. But just because God condemns the sin of Canaan doesn't mean he won't overlook the sin of anyone else. Just because he condemns the sin of Canaan doesn't mean he won't pardon the repentant among them. Rahab was a Canaanite who turned to the Lord, which tells us that the repentant of heart can turn to the Lord and still find mercy. But again, God is the one who fights the battle. And you really start to notice this when you hear their military strategy in the next chapter. I mean, you can just imagine this scene, can't you? The, the next morning, Joshua comes in after this encounter with the Lord. He's got a pep in his step. He gathers up his men. And he says, all right, men, here's how we're going to take Jericho. We're going to march around the walls of the city for six days. And you know what? We're going to position our priests on the front lines. And stay with me here. We'll give them ram's horns to blow. On the seventh day, we'll march around the fortified walls seven times. And on the seventh time, I want all of you to shout like we've just won. That's how the walls are going to come down. And the whole time, the men are just nodding their heads. What are they supposed to say? You know, Joshua, no art of war. But I think it just might work. <laughs> They're probably wondering, have you lost your mind? What, do you think we're going to kill them with laughter? But then after all the groaning, all the complaining, Joshua pulls them back in. And he says, men, you're right. This all sounds crazy, doesn't it? But honestly, what's the greater miracle? Remember what God did for our forefathers in Egypt? how he crushed their foes in the Red Sea? Remember what we just saw him do at the Jordan? Or how he provided our daily bread in the wilderness? What about even the seemingly small things? Not even the sandals on our feet wore out these past 40 years. How do you explain that? Every time we've gone against the promises of God, things did not go well for us. I'm telling you, I'm convinced that even in this, our God is with us. And they say, well, then let's get the ram's horns. But listen, today we blow our horn of victory, not over the conquest in Canaan, but through the cross of Christ. Because on the night before our greatest battle, the commander of the Lord's army showed up again. But this time, our only orders were to watch and wait because he was taking the judgment of God upon himself. See, the cross of Christ has become our greatest boast because it's the place where every sinner can receive forgiveness of sins. Because it's the place where the commander of the Lord's army fought our battle of sin and death for us. And though he was slain on our behalf, he emerged victorious. And now because he lives, so do we. And finally, you should notice that Moses and Joshua are not the only people to experience a holy encounter with the Lord. Burning bush, commander of the Lord's army, Every Christian today has this kind of experience. It may not have seemed so outwardly supernatural, but inwardly to say what happened was supernatural is the only explanation that makes any sense. Anyone can convert to other religions, whether by force or by reason. But to truly become a Christian requires 
Nothing less than the Spirit of God to bring you from death to life. In other words, becoming a Christian is nothing short of miracle. And you know, Moses and Joshua, they were servants of the Lord, which was high praise in the Old Testament. But now as followers of Jesus, God has changed our status. In John chapter 15, Jesus told his disciples, You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. And as friends of God, He's empowered us with His Spirit, meaning He has not only promised us His presence, but He's supplied it. And then later in John, after his resurrection, Jesus appears to his disciples saying, Peace be with you, because the battle has already been won. He shows them his wounds. He says, touch, see, believe. Because he wants his presence and works to be their source of confidence. And then he says to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Can't you imagine Jesus standing before you with his nail-pierced hands lifted as he's saying, peace be with you. And you realize in that moment the price of peace required the death of Christ. And His words echo in your ears, just as the Father sent me, now I am sending you. And you start to realize, if God sent Jesus to serve and give His life as an offering for me, then how am I positioned to serve Him now from a heart posture of gratitude? love. God has uniquely gifted you with His Spirit for His purposes. So what has He called you to do for the cause of Christ? Ultimately, His purposes involve gospel proclamation and discipleship for the advance of Christ's kingdom. We don't live this way to earn God's love. We live this way because He loves us and wants us to joyfully receive what He is so pleased to give. He wants us to enter the gates of Zion City, our land of rest, and to enjoy our reward, which is life with Christ. That's what He's offering you today. If you'll receive it, if you'll step out in faith, If you'll follow, He's leading before you. He will take you where you need to go. He will see you through. Let's invite the band to come back up. invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, as we have declared this morning, You are the one who fights our battles. God, You have fought the battle against sin and death for us. God, You have emerged victorious through Your Son, Jesus. We God, if we know that if he has been raised, for all who believe, we will be raised with you. God, that you are doing this work, that you have started it, and what you have started, you will bring to completion in Christ. So God, may we be filled with confidence. If there's anyone here this morning who's still on the fence about this, God, who's still on the fence about what you have done, God, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them. God, would you give them one of these supernatural encounters. May they encounter your presence. Because God, when we truly encounter your presence, we're shaken. We know, we know it's not us who's leading our lives. But God, it's you who has rule. God, I pray that we would learn to bow the knee and say, rule me. Tell me where you want me to go. Give me the strength to do it. God, may we trust you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.